Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jane Robinson, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Engagement and Place at Newcastle University. Welcome to tonight's Newcastle Debates events. This is the second event of our series where we will be discussing how we can revitalise our city and our region in a post-pandemic world. If you're tweeting about the event this evening and want to share your thoughts, please do use the hashtag Newcastle Debates. We've already received quite a number of questions um, from, uh, from members of, of the public, which I'll be putting to our panel shortly. But if you'd like to join the debate live, please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, you'll also see uh, some opinion polls appearing on the screen, so um, please do share your views. Um, for our first um, poll, we, we asked you where you're watching from, so um, let, let's see where people are from. Okay, so 43% um, of us from, um, from Newcastle, as you can probably see, I'm, I'm uh, sitting in Newcastle University with the uh, um, Civic Centre right behind me um, and a number of people from across the northeast and, uh, and some from outside of the region as well, which is great. So you're all very uh, welcome to this debate tonight. So I'm very grateful to our panellists who um, have, um, uh, are giving up their time for this evening. We've got a great um, panel, which I think will bring a mix of perspectives and experiences to this, uh, this discussion. Um, I'll just intro take a moment to introduce them one by one. So um, firstly, um, Lucy Winskill. Um, Lucy is Chair of the North East Local Enterprise Partnership and also Pro Vice Chancellor, Employability and Partnerships for Northumbria. University. Um, the two universities work very closely together in the city and, and the region, so I'm delighted Lucy can join us. Lucy was appointed as chair of the North East LEP in September 2020, so um, has been dealing with the impacts of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic throughout and is also a trustee of Live Theatre um, and the, uh, the Community Foundation and the Life Science Centre. Um, she joined Northumbria University in 2010 following a successful career as a litigation lawyer and she focuses very much on economic growth and regeneration both within the North East but as a strong champion for the region at a national level. So Lucy, welcome. Um, Atul Malhotra is Operations Director for the uh, Malhotra Group. After graduating uh, with a degree in Business Studies, he was tasked with overseeing the growth of the leisure arm of the group. The leisure portfolio has grown into an ever-expanding regional collection of hotels, restaurants and bars. And Atoll is a member of the Darris Hall Estates Committee and on the board of several foundations and supports a range of local charities. And in 2020, he was shortlisted for the Institute of Directors Northeast Director of the Year. Welcome, Atoll. And um, moving on, Abigail Pogson is Managing Director of Sage Gateshead. Abigail is passionate about the cultural he heritage of the North East and protecting cultural institutions in our cities and smaller towns and, and rural settings and uh, we've worked together for, for many years. Abigail's also co-chair of the um, at Newcastle Gateshead Cultural Venues which is a, an alliance of cultural venues working together to maximise the economic potential of the North East cultural sector. So welcome to you Abigail. And last but by no means least, um, can I welcome Sarah Green. Um, Sarah is Chief Executive of the Newcastle Gateshead Initiative, um, uh, the Destination Management and Inward Investment Agency for Newcastle and Gateshead. She's a qualified lawyer um, and has, has worked in Shanghai, Hong Kong and London passionate about business and the regional economic development. She was previously Director of Regions and Nations at the CBI. Sarah is a non-executive director uh, at Ryder Architecture, Tyne and Weir Archives and Museums, a council member of the National Trust and also a member of our court at Newcastle University. So welcome to our panel. Um, we're delighted that you can join us uh, this evening. So as I say, these are questions that have been submitted to us um, by uh, members uh, of the public. And I want to sort of start by um, asking about sort of, you know, the impact of, of, of COVID-19 in the sense that it's affected different places and groups more 
more than others. And I, I wanted to get your perspectives on, on how you feel that central government can do to help us and what we need to be doing in the region. So perhaps if I can, first of all, Lucy, come to you with that question. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Jane. We went into the pandemic in the northeast um, slightly on the back foot. We know um, we had the highest unemployment figures uh, at the time and we were lagging behind. And therefore, it's I'm going to start on the negative, but it's uncharacteristic of me. I will get onto the positive. We um, th there is much, much ground to make up. But I would say that we are making up the ground. If you look at the recent employment figures um, or unemployment figures, it depends which, which lens you're looking at, we're making good progress and uh, we're actually beginning to close gaps now. Um, and I think generally, if you look at the data and you look at various surveys going around and about, there's a degree of optimism, notwithstanding that we have seen some real blows to the Northeast and notwithstanding that tragically some businesses have taken a real hammering and we must never um, underestimate the impact on, on businesses and therefore families, um, uh, workers and so on. Uh, your question about what can central government do uh, and what can local government and, and what can we do in the region, I think can be answered in this way. We have to continue to be on the front foot and we have to continue to put our message in a very strong evidence-based way to government about the um, opportunities in the Northeast. And there are many. And in particular, if you look at the, um, the latest um, government plan for growth, it has three key areas, levelling up. We need to know much more what that will mean for the region and how we can um, explain to a government what levelling up will do for us and why it's important to include the Northeast in that. It's about trade and export, where outside of London and the Southeast, we've got a really strong track record of trade and export from the Northeast. Uh, and it's about the green economy as well. And again, if you look at the sort of natural assets we have up and down the Northeast coast, for example, uh, wind and green energy and so on, there are, there are lots of opportunities there. So I think it's really important that, that the um, Northeast LEP and anyone else, uh, all LEPs, recognize their strengths in their region, keep putting the case to government and they utilize the networks in all sorts of ways. So the Northeast LEP works very closely with what we call NP11, which is a gathering of the 11 LEPs in the area. But similarly, the LEP is a partnership um, and a very good response and recovery plan. The LEP held the pen, but crafted with so many partners, putting in a bid for 2.8 billion pounds to government was a good example of really arguing the case to government. So that partnership piece is something that we've really got to keep working on. And, and the LEP, as, as you know, is a partnership between the seven local authorities, the elected mayor, um, the business membership organizations play a key part in that. Uh, the community and voluntary sector uh, sit on the board the universities and further education colleges are represented too. Have I missed anyone out? I think that's it. But it's a, it's a really strong collaborative piece and I think that's very important and, and where I've just been um, really struck coming in still fairly recently as chair of the LEP, just how strong and cohesive that collaboration and working together has been in the region. So I'll pause there, Jane, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Lucy. And I think that theme of collaboration will come up later in our discussions and uh, is, is in the Q&A chat. So we'll, we'll, we'll pick up on that theme. Um, I, I mean, there's a very real sense that different parts of, uh, of the economy have been affected in different ways. And Atala, I'd like to come to you really in terms of the experience, particularly around hospitality and, and the extent to which, you know, central government has been able to help and, and, and what, what you think need, is going to be important as we come, uh, come through to recovery. I think you're on mute, Atal. Um, the furlough scheme, if you look at it, there's it's a lot of positives and negatives. It's saved a lot of jobs. Um, but the last 12 months, we found particularly in hospitality, um, no one wants to come back to hospitality. Um, the furlough scheme makes it challenging for people to commit. And I think in the last 12 months, people have retrained and have now gone to work in different sectors. Um, we've been on calls with some of our staff that have been on furlough over the past yeah, uh, recently in the last four to six weeks, ask them to come back. And unfortunately, they're happy to stay on furlough, but they don't want to come back. The The comments are, we have 
don't want to come back and work in the hospitality industry. We don't want to work at nighttime economy anymore. It's more nine to five job. And I think lifestyles have changed. Um, so that's extremely challenging. Um, the government, you know, have done a fantastic job keeping them, we keep everyone's job safe. But at the same time, it's a chicken and egg situation. It's it's really hurt hospitality massively. And um, we've budgeted for probably 18 to 24 months before we get to the levels of where we used to be. Um, and it, it, although, you know, we're happy we're, we're open again and we'll see what June the 21st bring, brings us, but uh, it's still going to be extremely challenging um, in terms of staffing, getting the levels of staffing where you need them. But more importantly, training, because all the new staff that are coming through, uh, unfortunately, are inexperienced. It's their first job in hospitality. So you need to spend more time training. Therefore, it hurts your wage percentage. So it's it's really challenging. At times. Mm -hmm. So some challenging times. I think that point about training and sort of skills and reskilling is one we'll probably come back to. But I'm interested, Abigail, in your experience from a cultural perspective, because I think we're all very conscious that the, the um, cultural venues have, have, have also been um, particularly hard hit by the restrictions. Yeah, to, to quote somebody else, it's been the best of times and the worst of times. So on the one hand, you're, you're right, um, cultural venues have been closed for around 15 months now, and that's been uh, really, really tough for the entire uh, sector. For example, Sage Gates had, has had 80% of its income just, just stopped overnight uh, when we had to close. On the other hand, we've seen uh, within the sector huge innovation and uh, new streams of, of work happening. And alongside that, and in response to that, huge demand from people to connect with uh, culture and creativity and to use that and be a part of that through this incredibly challenging period. So on the, on, the, on the one hand, it's been very, very difficult, but on the other hand, the demand has been uh, extremely high. And at Sage Gateshead, we've tried to meet that as we can by putting our work online and ensuring that we're doing as much as we can to, to, to meet that need. And also being in dialogue with audiences and communities and, and, and young people about what's going on for them and, and, and what's, um, what, what they want next. And for me, that's one of the crucial things in this, to be in a really good dialogue with our region about how collectively we rebuild, because it's not just a question of uh, come the early autumn, we'll all be reset and, and, and off we go again. We're going to be handling the effects of this for a, a long time. And the, the kind of, the, the thing that we talk about a lot is, how what is what is going to happen to our collective and our individual mental health um, where where are young people going to be on, on the back of this and uh, what where, where is this going to leave us in relation to quality those three things are the, are the three things that I think collectively we should be gathering around and finding ways with our respective resources and our respective contributions to uh, to to work for our region through Thanks, Abigail. And I think that that sense that it's both the economic and social impacts that we need to sort of think about and, and the long term impacts on our on our communities. And, and you made the point about kind of listening to what's important to our communities to develop those plans. And I know, Sarah, that's something that NGI have been very much involved with. Um, can you share a little bit about sort of your perspectives from from NGI around that? So I think, I mean, we've been talking to 30 different groups across the city about what they want for the long term in the city. Uh, and I think this splits into two parts. We've got the immediate aftermath of coming out of the crisis. And, and let's be honest, the question said COVID-19 has affected. It's affecting at this moment places and communities and people and businesses. There are groups of businesses who are yet to open until June. And there are businesses that you know, are finding it very difficult to operate. There are other businesses that have innovated and done absolutely incredible things through mm -hmm. this period. 
Um, and there, you know, and, and, and so I, it's very difficult. The, the first thing is to segment and to understand. And, and I think we've seen positive things that people don't want to lose. There are senses of community. There are people who volunteered for the first time during COVID who really want to continue to volunteer and want a more formal structure in which to do that. Um, there, there is, uh, you know, innovation that's happened. There are people who've learned digital skills that perhaps previously were struggling to get online. Um, so I, I think there's a huge number of things that people want to keep and want to work with. Flexible working is a really interesting one. You know, all of the surveys show that very few organisations will go back to work in the way they did with people going in nine to five, Monday to Friday. So, so the world is going to look very different. And I think we need to map that out and we need to, it's not one scenario. We've got to plan for a number of scenarios as we go forward and think about how we respond and adapt and recognise that reputations are quite often made in crisis. So we've got an opportunity to come out of this and change perceptions about who we are and what we do by how we respond. Thanks, Sarah. And I think that's an interesting question that's come up in the chat is around, you know, as much as asking um, what the government can do the, to the, for the North East, it's what we can offer um, in terms of the North East, if you like, to UK PLC. Did you want to come in on that point, Lucy? I was just going to um, uh, underline something Sarah said about how some sectors have actually done pretty well in this period. And, and you won't be surprised when I say that they're digital pharmaceuticals. Um, and green energy. These are the sorts of businesses that have really um, uh, many thrived uh, in this environment. And those businesses who have, to use that overworked expression, have really pivoted in, in either what they're producing or the way they work are the ones who've really, um, you know, seized the opportunities. And that's what I think we all want. We don't want to go back to how it was. We want to just go back to something that's better and different I think you know to, to look ahead to the opportunities yes build forward fairer I think um Sarah did you want to come in on that point I was just going to give a huge shout out to all the healthcare and public health professionals in the northeast because I think you know we were the first people the first hospitals to receive covid cases we stepped in and we took additional covid cases when other parts of the country were suffering and I think our NHS have done an absolutely incredible job. If you look at the integrated um, COVID centres, we've now got the test and trace that's happening here. And, um, you know, the further work that's going to be, we, we have set a mark for the region about what we can do on a national and international stage. And that isn't going to stop at the end of this crisis. We can build on that and create something absolutely amazing for this region. Yeah, I think great, great example. I mean, our, our first um, debate focused on health and, and we, we sort of heard a number of those examples. And I think that link between actually health, wealth and well-being um, is, is something that really we've we've sort of talk, we've really observed in the northeast. And the, the integrated COVID hub is a great example of responding to the health crisis, but also creating jobs for local people. So over a thousand jobs created through that partnership development. Can we sort of change tax slightly now and, and, and think about um, our, our city centres um, and, and, you know, looking at the, the changes that we've seen around retail um, and I guess for, for all of us, more online shopping as a, as a big trend. Um, you'll see the polls come up now. Can we just ask everyone to, to respond? How many times have you been to Newcastle City Centre over um, uh, the, the past month. So we'll see, we'll have a look at that poll. And I think if I could could ask um, uh, ask our panellists, perhaps um, uh, Atul, uh, if I could come to you first to sort of think about the the impact of, of those changes on the city centre, particularly um, the rise in online shopping, which has obviously uh, had an impact on footfall. Is that something that, that you've been conscious of? And, and how can we, how can I suppose we mitigate that impact? Um, I think we're fighting a losing battle against Amazon. Um, what he's done and achieved is just, you know, monumentous. It's it's really tough for the high street. Um, we own a lot of property on the high street in Newcastle and other various high streets in the northeast, and um, the footfall just is not there. Um, and what is it that you do? Do the council? start uh being fair with the rates side of things the way they the, the way they 
um, calculate them? Um, do the council uh, encourage landlords like myself to invest on the upper floors and make two, three bedroom apartments to, uh, to attract more city centre living? Um, these are all conversations that I've had um, and for the city centres to, to improve uh, in the northeast, you know, in the Thumberland Street now is outside London. It was up until a few years ago, the most expensive uh, rental per square foot in the, in the country um, uh, outside of London. Um, now you walk down Northumberland Street, um, there's a lot of empty units. We've just lost, we, we've just uh, had one of our sites in Northumberland Street being vacated as well. So we're looking for new tenants. Um, and we've noticed through COVID, um, a lot of our tenants, you know, the, the smaller one-man bands, they, they've paid their, they've paid their rent. You know, they've had, um, they've had uh, grants come through from the council and paid. It's the big boys, it's the nationals, the internationals. They want to renegotiate terms. They want to not pay. They want to give us every excuse under the sun. But then you read articles that they've had a hundred million pound fund and a hundred million pound grant being backed by them. And it's just frustrating. The high streets are, there's no quick fix to the high streets. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. That's my personal opinion. And I know, I know that, um, well, we've got the results of the polls in. So, um, so, I mean, I guess reflecting on um, the roadmap, we've only really had a, um, uh, a few weeks uh, um, since we've come out of, of, of lockdown, but um, we're seeing sort of um, about half have been between one and five times um, in the last month. So not too bad. And I know that um, uh, we are seeing the, uh, through the university um, tracks footfall through the urban observatory, and we're seeing a significant increase, but I think it is, it is building slowly and I know Sarah this is something that um, NGI have been uh, have been looking at um, do you want to sort of reflect on the future of the high street we have to create a reason for people to come back into city centres and it's not going to be the same reasons that previously were there you know the world has changed and we have to get on with that and um, but that doesn't need to be in the longer term a negative thing there will definitely be a period of transition but the starting point is many of us come into the city centre because we go to work now if we're going to work in different patterns then you know we need to consider what does that look like and how do we create reasons why we want people to come into offices or go to the city centre and, and for many people they do a journey if it's for multi-purposes so they'll go into the office if they can go to the shops afterwards if they've got a meeting with a friend or they're going out for a meal or they're going to the theatre or the cinema or they're going to the sage to see some fantastic music you know that that we need we need to animate our city centres we need to bring them to life we need to recognize that in the future they may be less a place of consumption and more a place where we enjoy ourselves and experience things and, and I think we need to just push forward with it. We've got fantastic cultural assets in the Northeast. How can we utilize those to bring to life, even if it's a meanwhile in pop-up ways to utilize the empty spaces, the retail assets that maybe are not going to be utilized. There's an opportunity for SMEs. You know, how can we utilize market spaces? Look what the Granger market's done through COVID. We, we need to just think differently and we're gonna have to be bold and we're gonna have to take some risks and be entrepreneurial with our public spaces be entrepreneurial in our approaches and I'm a great optimist and I think that something amazing could come out but it's going to take time and it's not going to be without pain. Thank you. And I think, you know, your reflection on, on kind of um, the importance of, of uh, uh, culture as, as part of that revitalised offer. I think, Abigail, um, in your role as um, co-chair of the, the, the Newcastle Gates at Cultural Venues, uh, is this something that um, uh, you've been looking at? It is, and I was I was just going to add that there's clearly there's a double pinch in that there's there's the retail question and then there's the how much are we working from home so that's there's there's both things feeding into to the shift in city centres and I think that it's a time to think strategically collectively about how we how we handle this 
I agree this will take time and it'll also take experimentation and kind of working working it through. But I do think that we should think big and 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 get ourselves to think collectively about it rather than than piecemeal. And that if that's if we do that, then then there's a chance that we can create a city centre which is about um is about experience and about affirming um life. Uh, rather than different segments of, of, of kind of work or shop or, or eat, something that is, is a kind of broader uh, experience that, that people will be attracted to. I think the other opportunity is around local centres that are much smaller than what we're talking about here, but we've really seen those flourish over this, uh, this past uh, period, and that um, I think is a, is a really interesting thing thing that uh, with the shift the other way to um, more working from home than we had previously could could really look, look different. And final point I wanted to make was that um, just looking somewhere completely different, the City of London, it's striking how they have really gone for it with uh, culture and creativity at the heart of their thinking about what they do with their empty office space and our are really kind of putting things things out there, trialing things on a on a sort of reasonably uh, big scale, uh, but doing it with with real confidence. And um, I wonder whether there's a similar thing that we can come up with here. Okay, so we need to think big and take some risks, Lucy. You said earlier, Jane, that we'd keep returning to the theme of collaboration and working together. And, and, and here I go again. But I think we're very blessed in in this city to have NGI and to have anyone who are such strong partnership players, um, thinking creatively and taking a lead and working with businesses in this way. But we're also blessed with two very large universities, as you and I know particularly. Um, and what we've really missed this year is the creativity and the buzz that students bring to the city. Um, it's quite forlorn always if you work in a university and then the students go. I mean, for the first day you think, oh, it's lovely and quiet. And by day two, you are really feeling it's a bit lonely and, and, and you want them back. And obviously we've missed that in this year. And I think as the students, uh, we get to the stage when they try, hopefully do come back in September, we have a sort of more normal cycle of student life again. Uh, and the international students uh, all going well will return to us. That buzz in the city centre will come, but we can work creatively with them. And returning to a high street or a town city, you know, a, a high street, city centre that doesn't look like it did before. Um, the chains are great, but let's have some other different ideas in filling that space. And I would say, let's use the creativity um, that the young, vibrant student population brings to a city. Yeah, I, I, I think certainly um, we, we're just beginning to sort of see some students coming back, but obviously end, end of term now. So we'll, fingers crossed uh, coming into uh, the autumn, we'll, uh, we'll be able to welcome students back. Um, and, and I guess that sort of takes us on to um, the area of, 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 of international travel and the wider visitor um, economy. And just wanted to sort of um, get the panel's uh, reflections on how the travel restrictions have impacted on uh, on the region and, and 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 what that will mean for our economy um uh, without um potentially for a period the income generated by our overseas visitors um can i um, maybe um start sarah with you uh, on that as the destination management organization for the area yeah so um, i mean you know, there is no question that international visitors are significant because they spend more when they're here um, and, and they may come less frequently, but but they, they, they spend significant amounts. So we think it's worth about 272.9 million to the economy. So significant. But, but I think if we're honest in our region, the domestic travel restrictions have had a far greater impact than the international restrictions. Um, and I, I think the key point is how we keep the assets in the region, recognising that there will be a period where we don't have international visitors, don't have international students and others, um, and make sure that we retain what we've got. So working with the airport to make sure that those routes come back that we're so dependent upon, making sure that those businesses that are focused for the international visitor uh, managed to survive during this period by, by you know, helping them innovate and helping them find ways to, to find alternative income streams. 
Um, so, so yes, we are impacted like everywhere in the country, um, probably less so because actually our international profile is less than other regions, but the domestic travel restrictions have been a real, real issue. Yeah. And is that something, um, Lucy, thinking about um, the, the wider regional um, position that um, how do we kind of really support the visitor economy, whether that's domestic visitors or, or international travel? Is that something that um, uh, is being looked at at a regional level? Uh, it is being looked at at a regional level, but the other, the other aspect of the international travel is the, the strength that we've had in inward investment. We've had some great international businesses choose to um, make their home in the Northeast in what's a very competitive environment. They don't have to come to the UK. They can go to all sorts of different countries and they don't have to come to the Northeast. And we've done really well at attracting strong businesses into the region and job creation and the supply chain and so on. The obvious example, of course, is Nissan. It's a very historic example, but the supply chain around that is, is massive. And the good news is, uh, and, and Sarah is much more uh, onto the, the up-to-date um, data on this, but the good news is there's a really strong pipeline of potential businesses looking to position themselves in the Northeast. And we need to get them here, of course. They need to come and see the city and they need to come and see the assets. And it's not just the office space. They want to work with universities um, and, and um, you know, capitalise on the intellectual property and the research strengths of the universities in the region. And they want the people who come and um, make their home here and work for them to have fantastic lifestyles and go and hear great music at Sage and see great plays at live theatre and all of the other things that are going on. So that inward investment piece is, is really important as well. We, we need to soon be confident to, to, for us to travel out, but for us to bring people in. <laughs> And I guess one of the things certainly uh, I think we've observed as a university is that um, actually during um, uh, lockdown, we have been able to maintain and build global links by doing things virtually that perhaps previously we'd get on an aeroplane um, and spend a week traveling to do. And, and I think, um, you know, actually those global links and relationships, um, being able to build those virtually will um, hopefully put us in good stead to have those relationships um, as and when things start to free up. And um, Abigail, I just wonder from a, from a cultural perspective is uh, have, have you found that some of those kind of um uh, global collaborations have, have 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 been able to develop during um during the pandemic we've experienced what you described jane which is that it is much easier to connect now isn't it and it doesn't take a, a whole uh, chunk of time out of out of your diary so exploring things uh, becomes a much more um realistic uh, prospect what we've focused on, I must say, during this period at Sage Gateshead is supporting musicians within the North. And that's where we've that's where we've put our, put our energy primarily. But the other thing about um, Sage Gateshead is that uh, over 15 percent of the musicians that are on our stages come in from outside the UK in normal times. So we very much have our eye on what that's going to mean uh, down the line, both. Uh, around this, but also I think there's probably some big shifts uh, going to be happening in it, not not just in our sector, but um, around uh, how we how we think about the climate emergency and what uh, what the the value of of musicians travelling around uh, the world to give live gigs uh, is. Um, that said, one of our core purposes at, at Sage Gateshead, and, and this is held by um, the entire NGCV network, is to bring really, really high quality arts and culture to people in, in, in the region. And part of that has to be about international perspectives. Thank you. And I, and I think, you know, that sense that, um, uh, as, as Lucy was talking about collaboration earlier, I think the way in which we can really sort of build those partnerships is to link together um, our economic um, aspirations with our cultural partnerships with the natural assets that we have in the region and so on. And I suppose thinking more generally about sort of how we um, really support the visitor economy to open up again, part of that is, is about giving the reassurance to 
um, visitors that, you know, it is safe that we're managing to comply with um, the constantly changing rules that uh, and restrictions that there, there, there have been. Um, and, 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 and I wonder, Atul, just sort of thinking about the businesses that you're involved with, um, do you think um, you're, you're getting sufficient support in terms of, um, you know, how you're having to adapt to um, the different restrictions and, and the assurances that are necessary to make people feel confident about coming back into um, hospitality venues, cultural venues and so on? Yeah, I mean, the, one of the first things we did was we signed up to the, you know, the, co the, the, the council COVID safe scheme, um, which uh, was an online application. And we, we got, you know, got our stickers, put them up. Uh, we've upped our cleaning regime. We've, it's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough gig to getting it to making customers feel safe, but then putting too many screens in the venue because if there's too many screens in the venue, a customer doesn't feel comfortable. So we're we're, we're very proactive in keeping our sites clean. We've up there, we've, we've invested in a fog fog machine, and we fog all our venues every night, um, particularly the the, the high for four ones, but certainly once a week. Um, in terms of comfort and and safety, it's making the, the customer comfortable and one huge um, benefit in which uh, in the hospitality game is seen is everything's got to be ordered on off, off an app now and um, you've got to get the technology right. It's a mix of um, keeping it safe, clean and offering good service. It's, it's a mix of everything. There's no one specific point to making customers want to come you've got to offer a good quality service make them feel safe and making sure the technology is working well um the last thing you want is to sit order a drink off an app and it takes you 45 minutes to get that you know and customers have been extremely since we've come back have been extremely understanding and the biggest thing we found is communicating with the with, with, with the staff uh, sorry with the staff but also the customers is when you seat them to the table explain explain the shortcomings, explain this new world we're living in. And this new world we're living in is going to be, a, a lot of it is going to be a norm and is, is, is improving the communication between us as a service provider and the customer. Thanks. Lucy. Um, I'm just going to answer my poll. Yes, I have it out. It's just flash the screen. Um, show and tell, I think, is really probably how I'd um, translate what Atul has said much more eloquently than that. And I was really struck yesterday by a um, very, very short video that Nexus, the operator of Metro, sent out. And it's just visuals, it's graphics. And it made me, it, it explained um, very quickly just the, how hard Nexus are working to make the Metro safe and um, how often they're cleaning and what they're using, all really simple, easy to understand graphics. And I thought it was very striking. Um, and I did indeed get the Metro and felt entirely safe and assured and it, it made me feel in a safe place. And I think we're gonna have to work so hard to show and tell and tell and tell and show and show over and over again that our shops, our restaurants, our theatres, you know, it, 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 it's what people are doing and it, it'll become a bit boring for us, but that reassurance until people become more confident about venturing out again, I think is so important. <laughs> Yes, I think that point about um, both um, uh, the venues, but how do you get to the venues is important. And looking at our poll, um, we've got 60% um, uh, have um, eaten out uh, at a hospitality venue, uh, inside or out. So I think it is is increasing. Um, Sarah, can I can can I come to you because I know um, uh, you've been sort of working with um, partners like 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 Nexus. Your your reflections on on how we can build that that confidence. We all have different levels of risk, and and I think some of this is going to be about people um, understanding where they sit and and taking the appropriate measures and having access to the information. And I think the great thing about our city is because of the data points that we've got in the city, because of the investments we've made and the innovations that are there, there is huge opportunities for people before they set off 
to find out what it's going to look like when they get into town and how they can manage um, their journey and, and their, um, their visits to the city um, if they don't want to bump into crowds, etc. So things like how busy is Toon, which tells you, you know, in real time how many people are in the city centre, where they are, what's happening, um, and tells you, gives you ideas about when might be a better time to visit if you want a quieter period, allows people to manage their own journeys and to make decisions about whether that's when they want to go or they prefer to to, to kind of look at it look at a different time of day I think the booking systems that restaurants bars etc have brought in give people certainty that when they're there they've got a seat they'll get seated quickly and they can order the food they can look at the food in the menu beforehand online they can they can think about what they want so all of these things help make the service smooth but you know I'm lucky enough in that through the job I've been able to go out and about and see how operators have um adapted to the new environment and hats off to the city there are you know they've worked so hard and there will always be exceptions and there will always be uh, you, know, you know slight issues here and there which, which, which require tweaks but for the vast majority of businesses and in the city they've done an incredible job they've invested huge amounts of money time resource staff training and it's a really safe place to be because it's really well monitored the, the city council are, are looking very closely they've got their assurances schemes a lot of signed up to the national schemes like we're good to go as well so there's loads of stuff online that people can check before they go um and and then when they get there you know feedback about your experience tell people what works perhaps what makes them feel more nervous but I, I think it's about getting people out on that first visit and giving them a good experience the first time they come out and then hopefully they'll keep on it yes yeah, and I, I think what's what's in, interesting as well is that that you know actually the importance of technology um, in 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 helping to give that that assurance, but also enabling people to access those those services. And I think as the panel have re reflected, some of these uh, innovations actually are things that will uh, will stay with us and and could actually help improve the experience of of, of, of people um, in in day day to day lives. So um, I'm thinking then, you know, we've talked um, uh, we've talked about the kind of impact on uh, on the day to day economy. And, you know, often we focus focus on high growth um, um, sectors and, and they are of course really important and certainly as universities, um, uh, I know Lucy and I would both talk about the role of innovation around the future of, eco of economy in those high growth sectors. But in terms of the day-to-day -day, um, economy, how how do we how do we actually support those that what you might call the foundational economy and in particular interested in in that question of skills and how we make sure um, that we are supporting um, people to make, have the skills that they need um, uh, for, for for the jobs that are are available. Um, can I come at all to you first? You talked about that kind of um, some of the challenges about having to reskill and and train um, some of um, uh, the, the people who are working in in your in your businesses. Um, how how do you think we can we can support that as as a region? Um, I think the whole. Uh when I was when I was young and I was at university, uh, internships used to be a, a big thing. Um, they seem to correct me if I'm wrong, but seem to have died down recently. But I think that's a huge thing that um, we uh, businesses such as myself have looked into. And actually, um, we've, uh, we've actually got five planned for the summer. Um, we've we've been re um, someone from Bros actually reached out to us and said they would like to come and do an internship in Newcastle with us. They've done their research on us and we've agreed a 24-week internship with them. Um, apprenticeships, um, uh, we are looking at doing lots of apprenticeships starting in September. Um, training programs, recruitment, it's the whole, I think it's the it's rather than just one particular area, it's it's a holistic approach. And um, what we've um, also looking at is I've I've been reading a book. I'm, it's a book on Lidl and Aldi, and you know they were doing graduate schemes years ago, and they were offering their graduates fifty, sixty thousand pound a year. You know, and I'm not saying I'm going to offer them fifty, sixty thousand pound a year, but we've we've had a huge um, 
sort of workshop in the, in, in the group, particularly with HR and the uh, heads of hospitality, we've looked at different areas that what we can do to, you know, there's a skill shortage, you know, I've, looked, I've spoke to four different operators already and it's only Tuesday afternoon. And the same common denominator is it's just not enough staff wanting to come through the, come through the ranks and work in hospitality. And, ho- and that's just one area. It's probably in a lot of sectors across, across the Northeast. Mm. And I, I, I mean, I think it's really interesting to hear that because I think Lucy turning to you, we, we, you opened this session talking about the impact on the economy. You know, we know that this region, I think, is amongst the highest, if not the highest uh, region in terms of furloughed workers. So how, how can we connect those, those people with the job opportunities that, that we think there will be in the future? I'll take a step back, Jane, and, and, and just um, comment on um, the work of the LEP which I think often there is a perception that we're very focused on the big businesses and making the big businesses yet bigger. But actually there's been a huge amount of work and there always has been about growing the, the SMEs and, and, and the S as much as the M's in the, in the SME market. And we secured funding from government to really help us focus on some very, very small businesses in the Northeast um, during the pandemic and um, supported crowdfunding um, uh, for various projects and so on, and worked with the community and voluntary sector. So there has been a recognition that it's not just about big, um, it's about all businesses and working there. The question about skills, um, a lot of the work that the LEP works uh, supports in partnership around skills has continued online. The real challenge I think for all of us is those who don't have digital access, um, and uh, we, we've talked in the past, haven't we, Jane, about digital poverty. Uh, and that, I think, remains a, a big challenge for the country uh, and this region where we, where we have levels of poverty still, um, and child poverty in particular. And I think there's more work to do there because digital access will transform education and skills and training. The piece about the skills always has to be that partnership um, piece with schools um, and with businesses. So the businesses articulate what they need, the schools and those who support them respond appropriately and it's an ongoing dialogue the whole time. Yeah, and I mean, I do think that um, uh, the way in which we come together as universities, colleges and schools to respond to those, those needs is so important. Abigail, one of the things that I've certainly heard from colleagues who have worked in the cultural sector is, if you like, the disproportionate impact on freelancers and, and independent um, uh, individual practitioners. Is that something that you've been uh, aware of from Sage Gateshead's point of view? Yeah, very much so. It's, it, that, that applies across the country and, and, and I guess more, more widely as well, not, not just in our region, but there has been a disproportionate impact there. And in uh, our sector, that is a very, very significant part of our workforce. And it basically, it, it's, it's the engine of, of what we're about because by and large, artists are freelance and they're, they're making work, they're uh, working with uh, communities or young people, they're, they're, they're actually at the heart of, of what it is that we do. So there's a really big uh, risk there which has not been addressed through this and I think thinking about um, the question that you were asking about, um, about how we move forward through this, it seems to me that in our region there is an opportunity for us to, for this to be one of the things that we think big and think as a region about because we've got this brilliant network of universities and, and, and FE um, colleges and we've got uh, uh, the connectivity and the partnership that, um, that is, is very effective. And if we could get a framework in place that um, means that we're ready when uh, when sources of funding are, are, are there and available, then that could put us in, a, in a, a strong position to address this in a fundamental way, because otherwise at the kind of skills level, um, there, as we've been discussing, there is there is a real issue. So that's, that's looking at it from a kind of bigger uh, picture. My part of that, the, the creative sector, is um, a not as insubstantial part in the, um, in the in the city, 
um, before you start to count uh, the freelance uh, community, which is bigger, and GCV is responsible for, for, for 2,000 jobs. So these are not, not tiny numbers. And as, as we know, um, pre-pandemic, um, our sector and more broadly, the creative industries were uh, a really you know, they were a high growth area and, and will continue to be and will not be affected by AI in the same way that uh, the other sectors will be. So the importance of, of supporting um, all those different parts of, uh, of sectors, some of which are made up of, 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 of individuals. And I'm, I'm keen to just come back on some of the, the, the um, questions that we've been asked. And I, I know um, uh, Atul looks like we've got another panel member joining us. So, uh, so uh, you're getting a bit of help there. But I wanted to come back to some of the sort of challenges you raised, Atul, around um, things like the question of business rates in the in, in, uh, the city centre and I guess sort of thinking about whether there are creative ways to address that because as I think that sense that often for businesses they they're making choices between investing in staff or invest or, or having to spend money on, on business rates and and just your your sort of the thoughts on on on, on how, how how can that question uh, um, be, be, be addressed I'll be honest I don't know what the solution is um, business rates at present are probably the, it's probably the main cost associated to a, to a business uh, and it is the difference between making a profit and a loss um, particularly the high band the high bandings depending on where you are located in the city um, you know we've got a pub in North Tyneside which has 10 to 15 thousand pound rates. And it does really, really well. You've got a pub in the city centre which has thirty to forty thousand pound rates, and it's a lot, lot busier than the one in North Tyneside. But the rates at the end of the P and L, the end of the year, it, it just just ruins it. And then you're right; you've got to pick between do you invest in money into that venue to make it better, to make it busier, but generally because of the the amount of rates that you're paying, that stops you from investing in staff upskilling staff, running a really tight strict wage percentage, which then has a knock-on effect to service, which then has a knock-on effect to, you know, negative comments on social media and, and trip advisors. So, you know, we start with a conversation with business rates, but you can see the domino effect that it does does have on to, to certain businesses and certain sites, depending on where you're, you're situated in the city. Uh -huh. So, but I think uh, there's some quite interesting sort of suggestions in in the Q and A around, um, you know, sort of tax incentives, different ways of thinking about this. And I think to Abigail's earlier point, you know, very mindful that actually in that foundational economy there are a number of people who are on lower wages, and it's really important that actually as a, as a place we we we're, we're finding ways to give people. <laughs> good 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 opportunities um, I'm, I'm conscious that we're coming towards the end of our of our discussion uh, and and we've had some some really um, uh, great contributions and some great questions and uh, and um, it's sad that we haven't been able to get through all of them but just wonder if I can come around um, uh, all, all of our panel members and um, go back to uh, our, our first um, question that was raised around um, the um, whether uh, our panel thinks that collaboration is the key to success of the future of the city. So um, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, um, Abigail, can I start with you? I do, alongside ambition and thinking big. Thank you. Atal? Most definitely. We've done uh, four collaborations since we've reopened after lockdown. We're working on the two or three, working with local brands, whether it's, um, you know, a spa, whether it's uh, a food vendor, whether it's, you know, someone else. I can't share too much because we're really close to announcing something soon. But we're certainly, that's an avenue that we're really exploring massively. And Sarah, optimistic about the future? Absolutely. And, and obviously collaboration is absolutely critical, but we need collaboration with purpose. And we also need to make sure that collaboration doesn't get used just as a talking shop. We need collaboration that's actually got delivery behind it and we need to measure that delivery and make sure that it's happening at the pace that we want and it's achieving the results we want. 
Yeah, collaboration with a purpose. So, Lucy, final word to you. I agree with everything that everyone else has said, but the collaboration shouldn't just be contained within the region. There are opportunities for us to collaborate with others out of the region. I'll just give you one very quick example. So today, the, um, the LEP has launched, again with partners, a paper about mine energy. Not my specialist subject until a week or so um, back when I was being briefed on this. This is about geothermal um, heat underneath the old mine fields in um, the Northeast, obviously, where we had a big uh, mining community, but also in the Midlands. Um, Bays are um, supporting this and it's an action plan about how we can just try and get some regeneration in the old coal mining areas, Midlands and the Northeast, green energy uh, and so on. And it's, it's interesting uh, policy stuff, but with a clear action plan as well. That sort of collaboration, back to Sarah's expression, collaboration with purpose, it shouldn't just be in the region, the region talking to itself. We need to look at other collaborations, and that might include international get my teeth in international collaborations around the right things that will drive the economy. Okay, thank, thank you so much um, to to our paddle. I think that's all that we have time for uh, this evening. I think I think we've got a very good sense of uh, of some of the challenges that um, we're facing as a city and as a region, but also some of the um, real opportunities and ambitions, and some of the things that we can learn from the innovation and um, uh, responses and collaboration uh, with a purpose as Sarah says, to, uh, to really help us to feel confident uh, about the future um, for our place. So I'd, I'd like to um, thank uh, our panel members for um, uh, their great uh, insightful conversation uh, this evening. Um, Lucy Winskell, Atul Malhotra, Abigail Pont Hodgson and um, Sarah, Sarah Green. And thanks um, so much to our audience as well for your questions uh, and for watching this evening. Um, we hope very much that you'll be able to join us for our next event, which will be Newcastle Debates Climate Change. Um, details are going to be announced um, on the Newcastle Debates website shortly. And if you'd like to receive information about upcoming events, you can also subscribe to our email mailing list. We really value your feedback, um, uh, so we would be grateful if you could please complete the short questionnaire at the end of this debate. So um, um, finally, um, I uh, just want to wish everyone a lovely evening and we hope to see you at another event soon. Thank you very much.